Hi everyone, welcome back to workshop and it's test equipment modification time again. And today I'm actually going to modify my Kikasui PCR 500M AC power supply. And the reason for that, in one of my last videos repairing a mini displayer, I came across an issue. Now don't get me wrong, the unit works absolutely perfectly, but I did have an issue. And that was, I had the mini displayer plugged in here, but unfortunately, the nature of the repair of the unit, I couldn't turn on and off the unit at the device itself, at the mini disc itself. So I was having to reach across and press the output button on and off here in order to isolate the AC output. And it was quite inconvenient because where I work is quite a bit that way on the workbench. So I ended up plugging in one of these into the PCR 500 in order so that I could have this more local at the mini disc and turn it on and off here. But ah, uh, this is a little bit inconvenient given the cable on the mini disc player was way long enough to plug directly into there. So I have an idea. What I'm going to do is I'm going to break out the contacts on the back of this output switch and run a cable to a remote switch closer to where I'm working. Now here is the old PCR500M front panel that I replaced and if you look on the back of the push button itself you can see the contacts there and two of the contacts are normally open so all I need to do is run a cable from here to a remote switch closer to where I'm working. And I've actually chosen a push button like this will sit very nicely on the workbench normally open push button here and it should operate the push button there and in fact it's green as well perfect and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this three and a half millimeter socket on the back of the unit and have a plug on the cable on the end of that new push button just so it can plug in and keep the modification nice and clean so let's get the PCR 500M out from where it sits onto the workbench and we'll open it up. Now here we are inside the unit and you can actually see the rear of that uh, front panel board there. I can actually see the push button contacts down in there so we'll need to remove it in order to solder on the cable and I'm just going to run it along down along here and up onto this back plate here. And this back plate can be removed for an optional card to plug in here. So it's ideal. I'm not going to be drilling the actual rear panel of the unit itself. I can quite simply drill this panel here and mount my three and a half millimeter socket. And let's see if I can remember how this front panel comes off. I think I need to take off this top screw here. And I think it just then it came out, if I remember rightly. Uh, something's holding it on at the top. Let me take the filter cover off. Ah yes, there's a tab up here. There we go. And that's it popped out. And there it is. Those four pads there are the push button. So I just need to measure them and find out uh, which ones are the normally open ones that are being used. I think it was this two here. Uh, from measuring the old unit, but I'll just double check. Right, I've got one finger on the button at the back. Yep. So it's outside contacts. So let's remove the rear cover and drill a hole in it. I have no plans in um, plugging a board in there which would obviously interfere uh, with this modification but I've got no plans in plugging in a board. I think there's about three different optional boards but no, I'm quite happy to have the functionality of the remote push button uh, than a plug-in card. And I think about there will do.
Perfect. Right, let's fit the socket. Perfect. I'll tighten it up and let's solder on a cable. So I've got this six core cable here that I've had lying around and I've got a good length of it so I'll use a bit of it for the inside of the power supply and I'll also use it out to this external push button. It's nice and flexible or reasonably flexible anyway and it's quite small, it'll do the job. There we go. Well, let's refit the front panel. Refit that screw. Perfect. So now we need to get this cable into this void here, but there's a little plastic cover and unfortunately there's no room up past here. There's a slide switch here, not sure what that's for, it must be something to do with this external interface, but there's enough room to get through the hole in this small plastic protector there uh, and into the void. So now we can solder up the socket and fit the back panel. And that's it on, so and I can now refit the cover. Now these boxes come with 20mm gland knockouts but I don't want to fit a 20mm gland, they're just too big for the size of box so I've fitted the 16mm gland and I just quickly laser cut a small 20mm to 16mm adapter and a little bit of heat shrink sleeving over this thin cable because it couldn't grip down tight enough and allows me to grip the cable quite securely. So that's it all wired up and I've got it connected, uh, still got the cover to put on but just to test it there's the LED there, I push the button there and I don't know if you can see that but it's lighting up I push it again and it goes out and I can do the same with this one here perfect and there we go, a nice right angle connector fitted just to keep the unit as short as possible I've taken apart the uh, old panel again because I want to take a look at the power LED. Now you may have noticed on the actual PCR it's rather dim and it was the same on this panel before I replaced it. So I want to do something about it. So I'm going to replace this LED hopefully for a brighter one. Now you may have noticed there's no series resistor with any of the LEDs on this panel. And that's because the drive for all the LEDs, the reading of the switches, the rotary encoder and these seven segment displays here will all be on the main board in the unit via this 30 way connector. So just for fun I took a look and I counted up all the I.O. required to drive and read all of the components on this display. And this is what I came up with here. 16 I.O. lines required for the 7 segment displays if you include the decimal points. The switches, if they're multiplexed, a minimum of a 3x3 three three grid. The encoder, well if it's the normal A-B encoder that's 2 I.O.s required. And the LEDs require a minimum of a 5x5 five five grid. So you add up all the I.O. there and it comes to 34 but then add on the supply assuming it's a single supply either 3.3 or 5 volts you come to 36 and that's more than the 30 that's on this connector here. But there's actually another way. Let's get a little bit clever. So you've got the 7 segments here and all the A segments will all be paralleled up in a bus, the B's, the C's, the D's, etc. all the way through to the decimal points. Well there's nothing saying you can't make up more digits i.e. a ninth, a tenth, an eleventh etc. from the individual LEDs here. So this could be segment A, B, C, D, E in an effective additional seven segment displays. And if you add them to the bus, 
then you will vastly reduce the number of I.O. overall that you require. And here's what it would look like. So OK, we don't need this individual LED I.O. count here and we'll add it up on the 7 segment drive. So we would need 4 extra I.O. lines to account for the 25 extra segments on that 7 segment drive. That takes it to 20. So add that all up now and we come to 28 plus the two supply lines, that comes to exactly 30. Now who knows if I've actually done this, I haven't actually gone and traced out the board to see if that's what they've done, but one trace on the board jumps out at me. So you've got the 7 segment displays here and the LEDs down that side there. Well if I turn it over, look at that, you've got a track going from that pin on that LED over to one of the 7 segment displays. But anyway, back to the LED, let's remove it from the board and we'll test it out and compare it with some LEDs that I do have in stock. So there's the LED hooked up to my meter here, just check the forward voltage of that LED and it's about 1.8 volts, quite a standard LED by the looks of it. So let's get it over to my constant current source and let's compare it, uh, driving it with the same current with another LED I've got in stock. So I've got my constant current source set up for one milliamp. Compliance voltage is right down as far as it will go. That won't make much difference anyway. And let's turn it on and see what we get. Wow! That's pretty dim for one milliamp. Let me put one of my LEDs from stock and drive it with the same one milliamp and see what we get. Right, ready for a switch on with my new LED. <laughs> wow, what a difference with the same one milliamp. This is going to be brilliant on the unit. Let's get it installed. Right, that's that LED fitted. Still got to put the unit back together, but let's try it out. Got it all powered up. <laughs> yes, it's a lot brighter and that's really visible. Perfect. And whilst I had the unit open, I thought I'd take a look at the actual front panel drive electronics here. You can see that 30-way connector with the flat flex going off the display. And there's a number of ICs around this area. At the top here, you've got two LV04As. Those are just hex inverters, you're similar to your 74LSO4. But they're capable of up to 12 milliamps so maybe that's appropriate for the LEDs perhaps but down here you've got a TD62783 and that's a source driver again capable of some high current drive and down there believe it or not that's an HT16511 and that's a VFD driver a vacuum fluorescent display driver now what on earth's that doing on this unit because it doesn't even have a vacuum fluorescent display and it's probably be being used to drive those seven segment displays because at the end of the day you've got to segment drive and as well as column drive built into this chip so it's probably just been handy enough for them to use to drive the seven segment displays and all in all they've managed to combine all the signals through this 30-way connector to drive all the front panel functionality as I mentioned earlier. And there we are, there's the PCR back in situ and that output LED is working absolutely perfectly. Now of course I'm in voltage setting mode so you don't see nothing on the display but if I just take it out into monitoring mode and turn off the output there we are, it jumps down to zero because you're monitoring the output there. So it's just handy to have that bright when you're in setting mode permanently. One thing I've noticed about this push button switch after having used it now is you can press this button extremely fast and it'll still be registered by the PCR. So it's off at the moment. If I just quick press on the button and immediate release it's registered by the PCR. So either the switch inputs are pulled very, very fast in the software or they're interrupt driven, probably the latter. But this is actually a handy feature uh, when this switch is at the other end of the workbench and I'm working on a piece of gear and the magic smoke escapes, the natural reaction will be to press that button and release it probably as fast as possible. 
So thanks for watching and remember you can always comment down below and don't forget to like and subscribe. It really does help the channel grow. Thanks for watching.